So that's P and, and P, but yes. the Complexity Zoo oh, yeah. is full of wonderful creatures. Well, so it's got about else? 500 of them. 500. Yeah. So how do you get... Uh, yeah, what, uh, yeah. How do you get more? How do you, <laughs> yeah? How, how oh, yeah. Well, okay. Made? I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean. Just for starters, there is everything that we could do with a conventional computer with a polynomial amount of memory. Okay, but possibly an exponential amount of time because we get to reuse the same memory over and over again. Okay, that is called P space. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's actually a uh, we think an even larger class than NP. Okay, well, P is contained in NP, which is contained in P space. And we think that those containments are strict. And so, the, co the constraint there is on the memory. The memory has to grow uh, with polynomially with the size of the problem. That's right. That's right. But in P space, we now have interesting things that were not in, in NP, like uh, uh, as, a, as a famous example, you know, from a given position in chess, you know, does white or black have the win? Let's say, uh, assuming, provided that the game lasts only for a, a reasonable number of moves. Oh, okay. Or, 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 or likewise for Go. Okay. And, and, you know, even for the generalizations of these games to arbitrary size boards, because right? with an eight by eight board, you could say that's just a constant size problem. You just, you know, in principle, you just solve it in O of one time. Right. Yeah. But so we really mean the, uh, the, generalizations of, of you know, games to uh, arbitrary size boards here. Or um, another thing in P-space would be, uh, like, I give you some really hard um, constraint satisfaction problem, like, you know, uh, you know, a traveling salesperson or, uh, uh, you know, packing boxes into the trunk of your car or something like that. And I ask not just, is there a solution, which would be an NP problem, but I ask how many solutions are there, Okay. That you know, count the number of of of, solu of valid solutions. That yeah. that that actually gives those problems lie in a complexity class called sharp p, or like it looks like hashtag, like hashtag p. Got it. Okay, which sits between NP and P space. Um, there's all the problems that you can do in exponential time. Okay, that's called exp. So. Um, and by the way, uh, it, it, it was proven in the 60s that exp is larger than p, okay? So we know that much. We know that there are problems that are solvable in exponential time that are not solvable in polynomial time, okay? In fact, we even know more, we know that there are problems that are solvable in n cubed time that are not solvable in n squared time. And that yeah, those right? don't help us with a controversy between P and MP. Unfortunately, at all. Uh, it, it seems not, or certainly not yet. Right. right? The uh, the 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 techniques that we use to establish those things they're very very related to how Turing proved the unsolvability of the halting problem, but they seem to break down when we're comparing two different resources, like time versus space, or like you know P versus NP. Okay, but you know, I mean, there's there's what you can do with a randomized algorithm, mm -hmm. right? That can sometimes, you know, with some has some probability of making a mistake. That's called BPP, bounded error probabilistic polynomial time. Wow. And then, of course, there's one that's very close to my own heart: what you can efficiently do do in polynomial time using a quantum computer. Okay, and that's called BQP, right? And so. You know, well, What's understood about that class? Maybe okay, as a comment. so P is contained in BPP, which is contained in BQP, which is contained in P space, okay? So anything you can, in fact, in, in, like, in something very similar to sharp P. BQP is basically, you know, well, it's contained in like P with the magic power to solve sharp P problems, okay? What, what, so, why is BQP contained in uh, P space? Oh, that, that's an excellent question. Uh, so uh, there, there is, um, well, well, I mean, one, one has to prove that, okay? Right. But uh, the proof, um, uh, you, could, you could think of it as uh, using uh, Richard Feynman's picture of quantum mechanics, which is that you can always, you know, we haven't really talked about uh, quantum mechanics in this, in this conversation. We, we did in our previous uh, yeah, one. Yeah, but, we did last time. But yeah, yeah we did last time, okay? But... Uh, uh, but basically, you can always think of a quantum computation as uh, like a branching tree of possibilities, where each poss each possible path that you could take through, you know, your the space has a complex number attached to it called an amplitude. Okay, and now the rule is, you know, when you make a measurement at the end, will you see a random answer? 
Okay, but quantum mechanics is all about calculating the probability that you're going to see one potential answer versus another one, mm -hmm. right? And the rule for calculating the probability that you'll see some answer is that you have to add up the amplitudes for all of the paths that could have led to that answer. And then, you know, that's a complex number. So that, you know, uh, uh, how could that be a probability? Then you take the squared absolute value of the result. That gives you a number between zero and one. Okay. So um, yeah, I just I just summarized quantum mechanics in like 30 in, in, seconds. Yeah, okay. In, in but, uh, but now, you know, what, 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 th what this already tells us is that anything I can do with a quantum computer, I could simulate with a classical computer if I only have exponentially more time. Okay, and why is that? Because if I have exponential time, I could just write down this entire branching tree mm -hmm. and just explicitly calculate each of these amplitudes, right? You know, that will be very inefficient, but it will work, right? It's enough to show that quantum computers could not solve the halting problem, or, you know, they could never do anything that is literally uncomputable in Turing sense. Okay, but now, as I said, there is even a stronger result which says that BQP is contained in P space. Yes. The way that we prove that is that we say, if, if all I want is to calculate the probability of some particular output happening, you know, which is all I need to simulate a quantum computer, really, then I don't need to write down the entire quantum state, which is an exponentially large object. All I need to do is just calculate what is the amplitude for that final state. And to do that, I just have to sum up all the amplitudes that lead to that state. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's an exponentially large sum, but I can calculate it just reusing the same memory over and over for each term in the sum. And hence, hence the P in the P hence space. Hence the P space. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So what, uh, out of that whole complexity zoo, mm -hmm. and it could be BQP, what do you yeah. find is the most... Uh, uh, the class that captured your heart the most was the most <laughs> beautiful class. It's just, well, yeah. I, I, I used uh, as my email address uh, bqpqpoly at gmail.com just because uh, bqp slash qpoly. Uh, well, you know, it, it, amazingly, no one had taken it. Okay? Uh, amazing. But, <laughs> but, you know, but th 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 this is a class that I was involved in sort of uh, defining, proving the first theorems about uh, in 2003 or so. So it was kind of close to my heart. Uh, but this is like if we extended... Um, BQP, which is the class of everything we can do efficiently with a quantum computer, uh, to allow quantum advice, which means imagine that you had some special initial state, okay, that could somehow help you do computation. And maybe um, such a state would be exponentially hard to prepare, okay, but, you know, maybe somehow these states were formed in the Big Bang or something, and they've just been sitting around ever since, right? If you found one, and if this state could be like ultra power, there are no limits on how powerful it could be, except that this state doesn't know in advance which input you've got, mm -hmm. right? It only knows the size of your input, you know, and then that, that, that's BQP slash Q poly. So that's, that's one that I just personally happen to love, okay? But, um, you know, if you're asking like, what's the, you know, there's there's a, there's a class that I think is 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 way more beautiful than you know or fundamental than a lot of people even within uh, this this field realize that it is. Mm -hmm. That class is called SZK or statistical zero knowledge, um, and you know there's a very very easy way to define this class, which is to say suppose that I have two algorithms that each sample from probability distributions, mm -hmm. right? So each one just outputs random samples according to, you know, possibly different distributions. And now the question I ask is, you know, you know, let's say distributions over strings of n bits, mm -hmm. you know, so over an exponentially large space. Now I ask, are these two distributions close or far as probability distributions? Okay, any problem that can be reduced to that, you know, that can be put into that form, is an SDK problem. And w the way that this class was originally discovered was completely different from that mm -hmm. and was kind of more complicated. It was discovered as the class of all of the problems that have a certain kind of what's called zero knowledge proof, 
basically zero knowledge proofs are one of the central ideas in cryptography. Um, you know, Shafi Goldwasser and Silvio Micali won the Turing Award for you know inventing them, and they're at the core of even some some cryptocurrencies that you know people people uh, use uh, nowadays. But um, there are zero knowledge proofs or ways of proving to someone that something is true like you know that there is a uh, uh, a solution to this you know uh, optimization problem or that these two graphs are isomorphic to each other or something but without revealing why it's true without revealing anything about why it's true okay SDK is all of the problems for which there is such a proof uh, uh, that doesn't rely on any cryptography okay and if if you wonder like how could such a thing possibly exist, right? Well, like imagine that I had two graphs and I wanted to convince you that these two graphs are not isomorphic, meaning you know I cannot permute one of them so that it's the same as the other one, right? You know that might be a very hard statement to prove. Like I might need you know you might have to do a very exhaustive enumeration of you know all the different permutations before you were convinced that it was true. But what if there were some all-knowing wizard that said to you, look, I'll tell you what, just pick one of the graphs randomly, then randomly permute it, then send it to me, and I will tell you which graph you started with. Okay? And I will do that every single time. Right? Let and me let, load that in. Okay, that's yeah, probably, I got it. I got yeah, it. Yeah, and, 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 and let's say that that wizard did that a hundred times, and it was right every time. Yeah. Right? Now, if the graphs were isomorphic, then, you know, it would have been flipping a coin each time. Yeah. Right? It would have had only a one in two to the 100 power chance of, you know, of guessing right each time. But, you know, so so if, if it's right every it. time, then now you're statistically convinced that these graphs are not isomorphic, even though you've learned nothing new about why That's they aren't. So fascinating. Right? So yeah, so so SDK is yeah. all of the problems that have protocols like that one, but it has this beautiful other characterization. It's shown up again and again in my in my own work, in you know a lot of people's work, and I think that it really is one of the most fundamental classes. It's just that people didn't realize that when it was first discovered.